Great to be chatting in our continuing conversation about nuclear energy with James Flay from Down Under Nuclear Energy. How are you, James? Well, thanks, Ricky. How are you? Uh, Excellent, thank you. Your journey into becoming someone who's advocating for nuclear energy. Tell us, you you came at this with a very neutral view, I guess, in terms of technology. I think some call it a technology agnostic view of how we uh, produce energy solutions for Australia. Yeah, that's correct. I started my career as an electrical engineer, uh, doing work mainly for industrial and utility clients, uh, and then um, have moved into uh, moved into renewables. Um, so we were building, designing uh, solar, large solar installations with with batteries um, for for clients, uh, and then and then oil and gas. So uh, I think I've worked in all sectors of the energy industry, uh, with the exception of uh, nuclear energy. And I guess it became apparent to me, particularly working in the in the renewable sector for several years, that the you know the promise and the opportunities that renewables present, but also some of the challenges uh, that that aren't well communicated and unfortunately are not well you know aren't really honestly acknowledged um, you know some by some of the people within the industry as well as some of the sort of politicians and advocates around the industry. So that was that was where it became obvious to me that you know renewables had a big role to play in our future. Um, but it was alongside other technologies, not not by themselves. So what are some of those challenges you believe renewables uh, do face going forward? I mean, we often talk on Flow about how much battery resources would actually need to de- develop grid-scale battery. Is that one of those challenges? Absolutely. So the, 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 when it boils down to it, you know, a lot of people talk about the density of, of solar and wind uh, not being sufficient to support an advanced industrial economy. And, and that may be true, but I think the biggest challenge, um, far more than the density challenge, is the intermittency. And, and of course, you know, a lot of people who you know, perhaps haven't had the opportunity in their careers to, to, to really understand the scale of the storage needed to support a very high penetration of solar and wind think, oh, batteries, right? I mean, we've got them in our phones, we've got them in a lot of our appliances, we just make bigger ones. But it, it's it's a much more significant challenge than people realise. And, and we will need batteries uh, going forward uh, to buffer the system, particularly with solar and wind. But that's not the same as storing sunlight up for the evening and storing wind energy up for a still day um, or a still week uh, or weeks, as they, as they sometimes have in, in Europe. Uh, and we we have here it's 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 an enormous challenge. And having worked in all of those energy sectors you mentioned, uh, you know, what is the infrastructure cost requirement developing out of renewables because it's being generated from places other than where we had you know power plants in the past. This is true, and you know when it comes to the costs, the the reality is is that we don't know. We just know it's very high, and and, and why don't we know? Part of it is to do with the storage. Um, you know, we spent quite a bit of time trying to come up with some sensible figures for how much storage is required to, to buffer a very high solar and wind system. And, and the reality is, after we looked at all the literature and looked at all the modelling efforts done around the world, we couldn't make a determination. And, that, and, and so the battery, the amount of batteries required, is, is really unknowable. Um, and furthermore, you know, there's a lot of talk at the moment about uh, doubling uh, or even tripling the size of our transmission network. A lot of the calculations for that are done based on you know, reasonably straightforward assessments of cost per kilometre of transmission line for a given voltage and a given power transfer capacity. But the truth is it's going to be very difficult to secure those transmission corridors, uh, much more difficult than it was when the original transmission system was built decades and decades ago. So we don't really know what the costs of the network will be. Another cost that's not well understood is at the distribution level. Our, our distribution systems are around our suburbs and cities were designed to take power flow in a single direction. And of course, now with, with the advent of rooftop solar and, and, and home batteries, we're trying to push it backwards. Um, and you know, the power system can take that to, a, to, to an extent. Um, but in order to, to go to really high penetrations of renewables and to, to make the most of that rooftop solar, a very significant overhaul of our distribution infrastructure is required in order to control that energy. And, and that does not seem to be factored in to many of the calculations we've seen. And I take it this is why you've formed Down Under Nuclear Energy is because from the nuclear point of view, you can theoretically place a, a nuclear generating, uh, energy generating plant in a, you know, where a coal or a gas was and it just plugs into the same network and doesn't have those extra network costs. That's correct. It makes the most of the infrastructure we already have. And it's not just transmission infrastructure and, and cooling water infrastructure. 
most importantly, it's the, it's the human capital available at that location. I mean, Australian coal-fired power generating communities have got an enormous amount of technical skill and experience operating thermal power stations. Um, that's, that's not easily replicated. And, you know, it, it just makes complete sense to, to repurpose um, the skills uh, and the industries in those areas to, to the nuclear to the nuclear site, and, and of course, make the most of our existing infrastructure. Because I guess that's something some people might not realise is that nuclear is really substituting, in a sense, the means of heating, you know, energy water to the point that it creates the steam needed for the energy. There's nothing different in that sense. It's just the method of generating the heat. Correct. It's just a it's just a big old kettle, same as the uh, same as a coal boiler. <laughs> We were just talking about your kettle before we came on here. Hey, um, James, but is nuclear safe? I think there's some people listening thinking, well, you know, is it safe? There's been incidents, of course, in the past. What's different now about the technology, what we're talking about here, what you're talking about with Down Under Nuclear Energy to the nuclear energy of the past? Sure. I think we should uh, be clear about one thing, and that is the nuclear energy of the past, particularly in advanced Western uh, nations, was very safe. Uh, you know, there, I, I've, I've heard conversations recently, oh, it's, it's, it's much safer now. And, and it seems to it seems to create the impression in people's minds that it wasn't safe once upon a time. And, and the fact is, in, in you know, the United States, France, UK, it's always been very, very safe. Um, you know, we, we look at Chernobyl, and, and that's an example of I mean, poor technology, which was a really a product of, of the Soviet economic constraints that they had. They knew the risks with that technology that had been pointed out to them, but mostly bad management, a really, really, really poor safety culture. The nuclear industry in the West, and now this is this has definitely shifted as well. You know, the, the Russians and the Chinese um, in recent decades have become very responsible uh, developers and, and operators of the technology. They share their lessons learned. There is a global nuclear operators forum. Uh, they basically everyone is on that forum sharing their experiences, sharing their lessons learned, and and making the entire global fleet of reactors incrementally safer every year. So nuclear is already very safe. Now, the new reactors that you know, we may look at in the future for Australia are a little bit smaller. They're better suited to our grid because of their size, but the, the, the fact that they're smaller and more compact actually has some safety advantages at the margins. Um, and really what that means is that if, you know, if, the, if the reactor trips, for example, and you need to, um, you need to cool it for the, for the days and weeks after it's been shut down until you can re-establish power, Instead of having to start a pump, do something active, take proactive measures to, to get the cooling onto the reactor, the new generation of small to medium-sized reactors will do that automatically. They don't rely on a power source. They don't rely on an operator to go out and open a valve. They use natural methods of gravity and convection to draw that residual decay heat away indefinitely and these for very long periods of time. And these technologies you're talking about, um, we're not talking about hypotheticals. A lot of Western nations, indeed most developed economies, are either you know deploying nuclear, getting into it, or are using nuclear energy anyway. Absolutely. Uh, it's important to point out that the, the sort of generation of, of reactors that you know, are being most seriously considered for deployment and are at the most advanced stages of deployment in this quote-unquote SMR category, are just a simplification uh, and miniaturization of existing technology. So we have decades of, of engineering and operating experience uh, that has been rolled into these reactors. They, they, they're really just small versions of what's already out there. And, this, and, and it's important to point out they're simpler, and that's, and that's why they're a little bit safer, is because they're, they're simpler. There's, less, there's basically less that can go wrong. Um, so, yeah, and if, if we look around the world... You know, we see the US, we see Canada, we see the UK, uh, we see France, big nations with big nuclear fleets saying, actually, we need to continue what we started decades ago and, and at least continue to have a portion of our energy come from nuclear. I'm not advocating for 100 percent, but but a reasonable portion. It's emissions free. It's reliable. Um, it doesn't it doesn't. Uh, the price of nuclear electricity is not overly affected by the price of uranium, for example, you know, whereas we see with gas. Gas is a wonderful fuel, but the cost of gas-fired electricity really depends on the cost of gas because the fuel is such a big part of the input. It's not the case with nuclear. The fuel is relatively a modest part of the overall cost. Now, speaking, so there's lots of benefits to it. Yeah, and speaking of cost, I guess uh, we know all too well that there's this ban at a federal level that would need to be dealt with if we were going to use nuclear energy in Australia. But at what cost and how quickly could nuclear energy be added to our grid if that's where policymakers were happy to go? Yeah, certainly. So, the, I mean, I'll come back to the cost, but just on the on the time to, de to deploy, it really, really requires Australia to be ready. 
uh, we've got we've got I would say somewhere between two and four years of preparatory work, which we we ought to be really doing right now, to get the necessary laws, regulations, all, all those sorts of things in place to even be ready to invite bids. But once we'd gone through that process and we'd gone and invited bids um, to build the plant, we understood how it was going to be financed and and how the power was going to be sold. Um, from the time you, you start work or sign a construction contract to electrons on the grid, it's going to be about five years for one of these small to medium-sized reactors. Um, you know, and then subsequent plants will be a little bit faster. The first one will take longer and it will cost more. Um, and that, this is true of any technology. It's not just nuclear. It's true of anything you do for the first time. The price comes down as you do it more often. Well, I guess we've seen that with wind turbines, for instance, initially versus what we're doing now. Absolutely. I mean... And solar panels, they were prohibitively expensive in the late 90s and early 2000s. Uh, now they're really cost competitive. They're, they're a really good way of generating electricity cheaply. Um, and if it wasn't for the intermittency challenge, I, I think, you know, I, I think solar and wind would probably be a much larger portion of our overall energy mix in Australia in the future. But that challenge of intermittency, particularly in a country like Australia, which is isolated from the rest of the world electrically you know we're not connected to another grid we, we have to take, take that challenge more seriously than we currently are all right james flay from down under nuclear energy if people want to find out more about uh, what you're offering and proposing for australia where can they find out more yeah sure so the the website uh, down under nuclear au is probably the best place to get in contact with us um the site's going under an overhaul at the minute uh, we're putting up more content but but absolutely our contact details are there and and we're keen to talk with anyone who's uh, interested to learn more. Thanks again, James, for joining us here on Flow. appreciate your time today. Pleasure. Thanks for having us on, Ricky.